Gracious Lord, thank you for this time for us to turn to your word. Thankful for the power of your word. Thankful for the promise that your word is how you do your work. And so, Lord, we invite you to come into each heart and mind here now, setting aside our distractions, things from the week, giving us pause and clarity for the work you desire to do in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are on week five of our core series. Again, this core series is just focusing on the foundations of our faith. And today we we embark on the second half of the most important event in the history of the world. Last week we talked about the cross, the death, how Jesus suffered, he was crucified, he died, and he was buried. The death of Christ. And we analyzed the why of the cross, why it happened, and the what of the cross, what, what took place. This ugly truth and yet beautiful truth. And yet it's only beautiful because of what it's connected to today. And so our statement goes like this. We believe in Jesus who on the third day again rose from the dead. Jesus alive. The resurrection. And yes, it is okay to talk about the resurrection when it's not Easter, right? That's okay. I know it might might be hard. But it's a pretty significant matter because at the end of the day, if the resurrection did not take place, then none of us are Christians. Okay? Pretty simple. I mean that spiritually and I mean that historically. I mean the church would not exist, period. And there'd be nothing for us to gather and celebrate. So if you are a Christian here today, it's because of the resurrection of Christ. So it's kind of a big deal. Kind of a big deal. So today we're going to pursue this and we're going to see what it is and how it's then meaningful for us. And we're going to do two main things we're going to look at and then check some application out. The resurrection was predicted, the resurrection happened, and then we're going to apply that in seeing then, because of the resurrection, what are we assured of? And that's really the application. So let's look at this. The resurrection was predicted. And I think this is a point oftentimes that we don't talk about that much within the church. I mean, everything that we are talking about here, it was planned. Everything. The death and the resurrection of Christ. It was not a coincidence. It wasn't, it wasn't a chance occurrence where Jesus sort of fell into it and God's like, oh yeah, yeah, that, that'll work. Let's do that. Let's go that way. No. This wasn't a backup plan. I mean, Jesus knew all about it. He talked about it. It was the core of everything. And he talked about this in a very special way. This is a text from Matthew 12. And Jesus is responding. It says, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. No sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was at three days and three nights into the belly of the fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Jesus spoke about his death and resurrection, and he said it was what? What word does he use? A sign, yeah. Proof, right? Who are you? Well, you're going to see a sign, the death and resurrection of Christ. It was a proof that he was Messiah. And this wasn't the only time he talked this way. Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show us since you do these things? And Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, in three days I'll raise it. Jews said, It's taken us 46 years to build this temple, and he'll raise it in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Or from Matthew 12, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and go, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. So here's the deal, friends. He must have spoken about this many, many, many times publicly that were not even recorded in the scriptures. You know why? Because even his enemies knew that he was saying this. This is after he was crucified. The next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that while he was still alive, how the deceiver said, After three days I will rise. They knew this. The enemies knew this. This was a message that Jesus talked about. Therefore, secure the tomb, kind of a deal. And so Jesus knew what was going to happen. The whole thing was predicted. It was part of the plan. And now, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, Jesus made a lot of extraordinary claims that he was God, that he was the giver of life, that he was Lord. And yet it all comes to a head with this claim of the resurrection. People don't talk that way, right? This is kind of a big one. The final sign that Jesus 
said that will confirm and prove absolutely everything else that he had said and done before. We're going to come back to this and see why that is significant. So, so what actually happened? Did, did what he predict come true? Well, our answer comes to us through direct evidence, eyewitness testimony, and tons of circumstantial evidence. This is a text from Luke 24. On the third day of the week, very early in the morning, the woman took the pieces, the spices that had prepared and went to the tomb and found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. And in their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to him, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified on the third day and raised again. And they remembered his words. And so we know this account. It continues then with Peter going and discovering and other disciples going to the tomb. And shortly after, Jesus meeting with them and appearing to them and many others for 40 days. The scriptural accounts found in the Gospels are written by eyewitnesses. And they present a very, very simple historic outline. That's the kind of direct evidence that's so important in legal cases today. Eyewitness testimony. Eyewitnesses saying, hey, I was there. I saw that. This happened. And these documents have shown to be trustworthy accounts of public happenings surrounding Christ. And, and you know what? Of course, though, part of what's recorded there, as you know, are supernatural events. <laughs> in our anti-supernatural world, at least when it comes to Christianity, people try to get around this whole resurrection thing. You know this, and so do I. Knowing that if that did actually happen, then, man, everything else must be true. And so there are all kinds of really fascinating ways in which people try to get around the evidence. I just want to throw some at you real quick, just to help you understand. The first one's called the swoon theory, that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross. He faked his death. He appeared three days later as a conquering hero. Hmm. So how would a man beaten to a pulp, convinced to be dead by expert killers, just three days later roll a massive boulder to get out, overpower expert soldiers, and then convince his closest friends that he is alive and a conquering hero? Keep in mind that he had predicted his resurrection, so the authorities were not wanting that. And, well, and ex executioners are expert killers. If they fail, they were dead. So that doesn't seem to work. How about this one, the conspiracy theory? The disciples overpowered the guards, stole the body, and they made the whole thing up. Because, you know, I mean, why not make up a new religion that's incredibly hard, totally unpopular, and sure to get you executed? <laughs> right? How about this one? Disciples just thought they saw Jesus alive. Just hallucinations, which might work if it's just one person, right? Not 40 days with large crowds. You know, last time I checked, hallucinations are private and they don't eat with you. <laughs> How about this one? This claims that in the woman's sadness, because of course you can't ever trust women, right? They went to the wrong tomb and it just happened to be empty and so then they proclaim the resurrection, so that's right. The most controversial public execution with the death penalty attached to it, the Roman guards mixed this one up too, right? <laughs> Guarded the wrong tomb. And really, if that happened, again, the authorities would have said, uh, you're wrong, it's right over there. <laughs> this is my favorite. The twin brother theory. <laughs> Jesus and his identical twin were separated at birth, and Jesus had a, this lookalike guy, and he had somehow discovered this amazing re resemblance that he had with Jesus, and he sort of lurked in the background studying the public ministry of Christ, just in the shadows, because of course no one could actually know that he existed. And then he waited until after Jesus was put in the tomb, and then he overpowers the guards, he removes the large stone, he steals the body, he gets rid of the body, and then he presents himself, just for a few days, as the resurrected Christ. And this was really great about this, is that this man would have had to have known that Jesus was going to get crucified, so that he could, you know, long in advance, make the scars <laughs> to convince them. So it's pretty, pretty interesting. No, none of these naturalistic explanations hold any water. Their, pro their proponents know this. And yet, that's all they got. The direct evidence through eyewitness testimony is powerful. And yet, there's a massive amount of circumstantial evidence. What about the transformation of the disciples? We know this. After the, the crucifixion, they're scared, they're confused, they're in denial, and yet following the resurrection, they, they are fearless. They are transformed with conviction. Something had to have happened. The apostles had nothing to gain and everything to lose. 
They were hated, scorned, persecuted, imprisoned, tortured, exiled, crucified. And in the midst of it never said, hey, that never happened. Oh, I, don't, I, get, I made a mistake there. How about the immediate change in all the social and religious structures? And these structures that were so important to Judaism. Since childhood, they were taught these important structures, this national and religious identity. And yet history reveals something utterly fascinating. Within five weeks of the resurrection, over 10,000 Jews had given up and altered these structures that had given them their national identity for centuries. Animal sacrifices, keeping the Sabbath, other aspects of the civil and the ceremonial laws completely changed. Huh, kind of interesting. Why would they suddenly abandon all these traditions that had for centuries given them their identity? How could such a thing have happened? And in the most least likely place on earth, Jerusalem, the church basically blew up. In spite of all the odds against her, despite the persecution, the church grew. And within 20 years, it was all in the heart of the Roman Empire, thriving. Pretty powerful stuff. Yes, the direct evidence is strong. The circumstantial evidence is strong. And really the best explanation, really the only explanation of our evidence is indeed that Jesus rose. He conquered death, just like he predicted, just like he had planned. And praise God for that. Now, why is that significant? Why is it significant that Jesus predicted his resurrection and that he actually did rise from the dead? Why is that significant? What does it all mean? I see, I think sometimes we don't really have an issue with believing that it happened. Okay, yeah, yeah, Jesus rose from the dead. I think sometimes where we struggle is then feeling, okay, what does this mean then? What, what does it actually mean for my life? And so the application of this is beautiful. Don't, don't let this pass you by this morning. The resurrection assures us of five things. Five things. And this is application that just goes right down into the heart. The first thing it assures us with is acceptance. So imagine um, an ambassador to the United States. Let's, let's, uh, let's say Nathan is our new ambassador for the United States. And his role is to go to places. Nathan likes to travel. And so his role is to go to places and represent the interests of our country, right? Okay. So imagine that we here in this community, this church, are our own sovereign country, and we send Nathan out somewhere far, far away to deal with our interests, right? Let's say he goes all the way back to England, Okay. And he goes to this authority there, and, and because he's an ambassador, he has an audience. And he starts speaking with all these officials in England, and he says, you know, we feel bad about that whole independence thing. You know what we kind of would like to do? We're just, let's just forget about that, and we'll just come under your sovereign rule again. That war, all that kind of stuff, uh, we're just going to forget about that. We want to submit to the monarch again. Now, these officials are a little bit surprised. I mean, could this be? I mean, this seems a little odd. Would they actually do this? And so they then tell their superiors, probably, you know, it does, before long it gets back to us saying, um, your ambassador is saying some things that are kind of wild. Could that be true? Now, following that phone call, it wouldn't take long for us to pull Nathan off the field and fire him, okay? Because he's saying things that are just wrong, that are false, we did not send them there with that message. He's making things up on the fly. And so he is a false ambassador, and we are going to send him and fire him, right? Our government would not put their stamp of approval on what he is saying, right? It's the same idea with Jesus here. Don't miss this. The scriptures speak specifically in this area that God rose Christ from the dead. Look at those verses. This Jesus God raised up. The God of our fathers raised Jesus. Having been buried with him in baptism, which you were raised with him through faith and the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So what does that mean then? This is huge, friends. You see, by raising Jesus from the dead, God was placing his final approval on what Jesus said. If Jesus was teaching something wrong... I mean, if Jesus was saying something wrong about himself, if, if Jesus was saying something wrong about the kingdom of God, if Jesus was saying something wrong about salvation or really anything, God would not have raised Jesus. He would not have put a stamp of approval on him because he was a heretic, right? So what, what, is, what did God approve of? Well, this is just some of the things that Jesus said about himself. The Son of God, the Son of Man, 
the giver of eternal life. He is one with the Father. He forgives sin. He's the bread of life, the good shepherd, the true, font, the true vine, the great I am, the giver of living water, the light of the world, the future judge, the Lamb of God, the baptizer of the Holy Spirit, the door of salvation, the Savior, the Messiah, the healer. All these things, the resurrection of Christ <laughs> says, true, approved. The resurrection of Christ was not a coincidence, but it was a planned and predicted event. And since God raised Christ, we can say then that he is in full agreement of everything that Jesus did because he was not a bad ambassador like Nathan was. And this gives us, friends, great assurance, get this, that through raising Jesus, God the Father accepted the work of Christ, his payment on the cross. And if we are then trusting in Christ today, you and I can be sure that just as he accepted the work of Christ because of Christ, we then can be accepted in Christ. You see how that connects? Acceptance. We can be assured that our sins are covered. We can be assured that our penalty was paid for. We can be assured that we are covered in the righteousness of Christ because of the fact that God put a stamp of approval all over Christ. That is an amazing thing, friends. We can be the, have the assurance of acceptance. We also can have the assurance of presence. Jesus said right before his ascension, Surely I am with you always to the end of the age. He didn't just make that up. He didn't say, well, uh, that's not real true. And of course, if he didn't rise from the dead, that couldn't be true. You know, you and I, we go through ups and downs all the time in our life. We go through trials. We go through sufferings. We go through hardships. And in these times, there's, there's this just tangible presence of Christ. Is there not? How he draws near to us. He is with us. He is helping us. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Man, I think, I think we do. And we celebrate that Christ is with us, with his people. Where two or three are gathered, I am there. I am there at the table. And friends, the resurrection of Christ makes that so. If the resurrection never happened, we have no assurance whatsoever that Christ draws near to us, to the humble and to the weak. And yet, friends, because Christ is alive, he is near. Be assured of that. You can be assured of intercession. The Bible says, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus, he is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. And therefore, we are, he is able to save completely those who come to him because he always lives to intercede for them. Because of the reality of sin in your life and in my life, because of your weakness and frailty and my weakness and frailty and all these things in our lives, our struggles, these verses are absolutely beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. That Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords, the resurrected King, He is interceding for us. He is your defense lawyer. He is my defense lawyer with the Father, always reminding Him of Himself. And He looks down at us and says, oh yeah, He's mine. That's right. She's, she's mine. I, I've covered that. <laughs> Friends, if you are trusting in Christ today, what a promise that is for you. What an assurance that is for you that he is standing now at this moment interceding with the Father for you. Wow. Assurance of power. You know, friends, at the moment of our confession and faith, our conversion by the grace of God, we die to our sin. We are raised up with new life in Christ. And the scripture talks about this, how our, how our spiritual lives are intertwined with the death and resurrection of Christ. There's this intimate connection. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places. Friends, if you are trusting the resurrected Lord, hear this, hear this. A resurrection has happened in your life too. You have been risen with Christ. You have been snatched from the power of death and hell. You have been declared righteous because of Christ. And your sins have been forgiven. And yet it doesn't stop there. It was never intended to stop there. God is not only interested in the forgiveness of sins for you, he's also interested in transforming you. And the same power then that raised Christ from the dead is active in you. And that, that's what leads to transformation. 
If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Notice the motivation there. Notice the connection. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on things that are above. You see, friends, the resurrection of Christ is not something that we simply give mental assent to by faith. It is that, of course, but it's much more. It is not some sort of stale and musty doctrine that we we talk about in the church. The resurrection of Christ is the very power of God working in, for, and through you. It is the reality that constantly tells you that if you are in Christ, you have died to yourself, you are resurrected, you are a new person, you are a new creation. Christ's resurrection power is the only power then for growth and transformation in you. Christ's self, his resurrection power is the only power for holy living. You can't do that by yourself, and I can't do that by myself. Everything that God calls us to, he's doing through his resurrection power. He gives us strength through that resurrection power to put to death the deeds of the flesh and live for him. The power of the resurrection was active in the believers' lives right away in the early church. It transformed them, gave them boldness. It's what gave them fe- no fear over what man might do to them. It's what transformed them from fear to fearlessness. And today, that same power of the resurrection of Christ is active in a believer's life. It is the only way possible for us to fight our own indifference, our own apathy, for us to be bold, for us to be on fire for God and stand in the face of adversity and not compromise. It is only through the resurrection power of Christ. And friends, if you trust the Lord today, it is so important for us to remember this. You have been raised with Christ. Jesus is alive today, and because of it, you are alive. The same power is living in you. The same power is the source of strength for you. Don't forget that. Don't let it pass right over you. And the last one, it's assurance of hope. Being raised with Christ has even more significance than our spiritual resurrection. I mean, that's amazing. The power of Christ is not only at work in our life of faith, But friends, it's going to be at work in your death too. Because of Jesus, because of his resurrection, friends, the grave is not the end. The grave is not the end. We do not have to be terrified of death. The same power that rose Christ from the dead will also be at work in our resurrection. We'll get to that in about five weeks. It's a foreshadow. His resurrection is a foreshadow for you and I. It's a guarantee of our bodily resurrection to eternal life. Heaven, a place of total perfection because Christ has risen from the dead and through trusting in him, I will rise. Your loved ones will rise. No more afflictions, no more persecution, no more pain, no more suffering, but rather utter peace and perfection in his presence forever. Friends, I just gave you five powerful, life-giving, life-transforming, life-changing truths that we can be assured of because Christ is alive today. And that is the heart and the incredible beauty of knowing Christ. The fact that you and I, through faith in Christ, we can be accepted before God. We can have his presence with us in the ups and downs of life. We can be sure that he is interceding for us before the Father. And we can have his power working in us, changing us. And we can have the future hope of heaven, assurance. No matter what you face in this life, no matter what I face, these assurances stand irrelevant to how you feel about them. They stand in Christ and they are able to carry us And the more that we meditate upon those things, his resurrection and the reality of what it means, the more God's Spirit invigorates our faith. So if you are in Christ today, if you are trusting in him today, that's for you. Look at that. That's for you. The assurances are for you. The resurrection of God, friends, is like God's megaphone screaming at you and screaming at me, Everything he has done for us. However, God's stamp of approval regarding the resurrection has another side to the coin. Because not only are his gracious words true of forgiveness and salvation in heaven, but remember, everything he says is true. Everything. When Jesus says that I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. That means it's only through him. There's no other access to God. And God said, yeah, that's right. Stamp of approval. 
And so, friends, what that means is if you are not trusting in Christ today, those five assurances are not for you. You you have not been accepted before God. You, You don't have His gracious presence with you. He is not interceding for you right now, and His power is not working in you, and you have no future hope of heaven. That describes you. I I invite you to think about what Jesus is saying here. What did Jesus do for you? What did God the Father do by raising Christ for the dead for you? Friends, it's all simply too big to ignore. It's too massive to ignore. And so, friends, the last question for us then is, I mean, do you know that Jesus? Do you know this Jesus who is risen from the dead? Not the dead Jesus, but the real Jesus, the living Christ, the Lord of Lords. Do you know him? You can. And that's the most shocking news that there is. That you and I, sinners, failures throughout life and things that we struggle with, we know that there are things in us that are ugh. And if we're honest with ourselves, and yet we step back and realize he wants us. He wants you. We can know him. We can have our sins washed clean. We can have the promise of hope of heaven. And friends, as he comes and as he creates and he draws that faith and that trust in your heart, this then can be yours. Acceptance, presence, intercession, power, and hope. My prayer for each of us here, wherever we're at in this, whether we, whether we really believe that because of what Christ did or whether we're struggling with that or whether we're convicted by that, wherever we're at, is that the Spirit of God would have his way with you right now in your heart and in your mind in what you believe about Christ and that the Spirit of God would drive deep the truth of Christ deep into your heart, deep into your mind, working that faith working that surrender, and invigorating that faith and assurance in him. Father, thank you for the resurrection. (laughs) There's really not a whole lot of things we can be more thankful for. Uh, And Father, this is not just something that's academic, and forgive us if we've done that and turned it into that. But Lord, on this day, as we pause and consider the utter immensity of what this means for us. This assurance that we can be accepted before you. The assurance of the presence of Christ with us. The assurance of intercession. The assurance of hope. And the assurance of power. Lord, I pray that that would just invigorate our faith today. Lord, for those who might be struggling with you, Lord, draw near to them. Reveal yourself to them as the, as the risen Christ, as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Thank you, Father, that it is in you that we can have this hope. Grant us joy because of it. Thank you for your pursuit of us and what you have done for us. In Jesus' name, amen.